Okay, so we're going to start with the um, radiation safety and protective devices. And this is chapter 18 in your yellow book. And this is going to be, I believe it's chapter 9 in your Carlton Adler book. So your patient care book. And I've combined the two lectures together so that um, you have just one PowerPoint. So it's got a lot in it, okay? Um, there's the objectives. Make sure you can answer the objectives. Lots of them. All right, so radiation as an ionizing energy. So when we talk about radiation, we're talking about radiation that has sufficient energy to cause the ejection of electrons from atoms. So we're going to talk about that as we go through this, and we're going to talk about the different interactions that um, occur. So the loss of an electron results in ionization of the atom. So when the electron gets kicked out of the atom, it becomes very unstable. And um, we'll talk about the interactions, like I said. Ionization can have biological effects. So um, it can kill the cell um, and cause long-term effects. And you'll learn about those biological effects when we get to fluoroscopy in your second year. And when we're looking at doing an x-ray, or any kind of exposure to radiation, we have to do the benefits must outweigh the risks for any study. So if there's a study that is not necessary, we need to look at that and we need to question why we're doing it. Okay, there's two sources of ionizing radiation. There's natural or what we call background radiation and then there's man-made. So in our daily life, we're exposed to a lot of radiation. So as you can see on this side here, we get it from um, the air, air passage in Hong Kong to North America. <laughs> there's some funny stuff in here. So um, there's natural here. So from food and drinks like bananas have uh, radiation in them. Radon gas from the ground is a big exposure, especially people back east that have basements. There's cosmic rays and also from building in soils like bricks have, they give off radiation. So the annual dose to air crew flying 800 hours, so they're here, so interesting, huh? And then um, radiation dose in downtown uh, Brazil. So we look here in the man-made, um, we have a chest x-ray and we have a mammogram and an abdominal x-ray, as you can see, is a little bit higher. Annual dose for the general public here and then the average CT scan dose, and then we have the radiation worker um, there. So background, so like I said, you can get it from cosmic radiation, radioactive elements, radioactive substances, altitude makes a big difference. So people living in Colorado are getting a lot more radiation than what we get here in San Diego. So over half the amount of the radiation to the general public. So um, we get radiation every day, all day, and depending on where we live and if we fly a lot, uh, changes how much radiation we receive. And you can see here's another graph for you, help you understand where all the radiation is coming from. And here, chest x-ray, and just from the soil, we're receiving radon gas and from the foods also. All right, man-made radiation. So there's fallout from nuclear weapons testing and nuclear power plants. Exciting, huh? We know about Chernobyl currently. Industrial radioactive materials also. So um, medical and dental exposures. This is where the diagnostic and medical exposures account for 90% of the general population's exposure. So it's considered man-made. Oh, then there's that. So that's a Russian uh, nuclear bomb. Very exciting to see that. All right, radiation measures. Now, there's two different ways that we measure radiation. There's common units or traditional units, and there's the international units or the SI unit. It just happened that the ART just eliminated the common or traditional units. They said that starting 2017, they're not gonna be asking you guys what the common or traditional units are on your national exam. The problem is all of us here in the United States refer to it as common units or traditional units. So we are still gonna make you know these common or traditional units and the um, SI units in addition. So you will be able to relate to people in the clinic um, without just going to the SI units. 
All right, so with common or traditional units, we have the Rankine, which is the capital R. We have the radiation absorbed dose, which is the RAD. So each letter here at the beginning, R, A, D, the RAD, is radiation absorbed dose. There's the Rankine equivalent man, which is the REM, and we have the Curry. So in the international system, which is the SI units, we have coulombs per kilogram, sieverts, gray, and becquerel, and we'll compare the two. So the SI units uh, were officially adopted in 1985. So we went from the Rankine to the coulombs per kilogram, radiation absorbed dose to the gray, and the radiation equivalent man, which is the REM, to the sievert, and the curry to the becquerel. And you can see here, there's a graph. It's in one of your books. I think it's Bouchong. You have your exposure, uh, which is measured in Rankine, which is the R, and it's coulombs per kilogram um, in the SI unit. And it's the C over uh, kg. So the absorbed dose is the rad. The symbol is the rad. And um, it's in the SI units is the gray. Dose equivalent, which is the REM, and symbol is the REM, and we have sievert, and then activity is the curry with the C. It's actually CI. Um, I don't know why they just have the C here. I guess it can go either way, but I haven't seen it without the I, so I think they missed it. I don't know. Anyway, and then there's the becquerel, which is the BQ, and I'll give you a way to remember this a little bit easier. So you can see the conversion here and the R. Um, so if we look, multiply the number of A by B to obtain C, divide the number of C to obtain B or to obtain the letter A. So here, this is giving you the conversions for um, between the traditional and the SI units. Okay, so the Rankin, what is it? So this is the amount of ionizing radiation that produces in one cubic centimeter of air. Air is your key word there, air, ions. Uh, that carry one electrostatic unit of quantity of electricity, either positive or negative. So it's ionizing radiation in air is what you're looking for for the definition there. So the unit exposure for x-rays and gamma rays, so we use the Rankine for um, diagnostic levels here within radiology, and it's being phased out as a unit of exposure since exposure may be expressed directly as coulombs per kilogram, which is the SI unit. There's the radiation absorbed dose, which is the rad. It's established to measure the amount of radiation absorbed by a medium. So if we're talking about how much dose did the patient receive, we're talking about the rad. Okay, so it's unit of absorbed dose of any type of radiation. So the radiation, the, the rad has been replaced by the gray in the SI unit. So one gray is 100 rads. So it's not a direct conversion. It's not a one-to-one. -one. It's a one-to-100. The Rankin equivalent man, or the REM, so you got the R, the E, and the M, so the REM, is a unit that measures the biological effect of X-ray, alpha, beta, gamma radiation in humans. So the REM has been replaced by the sievert. So this is the amount of radiation to see changes within the body. So all of our dose badges are measured in REM. So this is the unit that exposures, it measures biological effects. Oh, and one sievert equals 100 rem. So just like with the rad and the gray, so we're dealing with the same thing here. So it's a one to 100. The curry, it is the measure, <laughs> measures the amount of activity that a radionuclei gives off. So a non-SI unit of activity, it's named after um, Marie and Puri Curry. So um, Marie Curie, as you guys have learned over the summer, she is the person that started up a bunch of mobile x-rays. She also did a bunch of research on um, radium and refinement and Puri and well, she got a Nobel Prize and then her Puri, her husband and Henry Becquerel received the Nobel Prize in physics in 1903. So the three of them got a Nobel Prize in physics in 1903. So Marie Curie, or Marie and Puri Curie, is the traditional units. So they're traditional, they're married, it's traditional. Becquerel 
is in the SI units. So he got the Nobel Prize with all three of them, but he was left out of the marriage. That's how I remember it. So the traditional units, they're married, Marie and Paris, they're traditionally married. And then you have the SI unit, which is Becquerel, okay? I don't know if that helps you remember it, but it did me. So it is defined as one disintegration per second. So the CI is equal to 3.7 times 10 to the 10th Becquerels. That's an easy conversion. All right, so Becquerel is a unit activity measured in nuclear medicine studies with radionuclei. All right, here's another graph for you. So this is radiation measures. We have radioactivity, absorbed dose, and dose equivalent. So we have the common units SI. So radioactivity, we have the curry. See the CI? The curry for radioactivity and the SI units is the Becquerel. So in common units, we have absorbed dose, which is the rad, and in SI units, it's the gray. And here we have dose equivalent, which is the RAM, and then we have the SI units of sievert. So it's, remember, it's a 1 to 100. So this is 1. These are 100 is the conversion. And then you have exposure. You have the Rankin, and it's coulombs per kilogram. So this is backwards in the way that I presented it. It's kind of good because it shows you out of order. So you just have to memorize this stuff, you guys. You're going to have to know both. I'm sorry. I'm not going to just switch to SI units. You have to know both because no one in clinic will really knows the SI units. All right. So here it is again. Review. The SI units is coulombs per kilogram instead of the Rankin. It's Sieverts rather than the Rem and the Gray rather than the Rad. So standards of exposure. Standards um, are regulated by the FDA and it's Center for Devices and Radiologic Health. Hold on. Okay. Effective dose limits recommendations have been set to minimize the biological uh, risk to exposed persons. An individual's dose should be kept as low as reasonably achievable, so a LARA. The annual whole body effective dose for a limit for the occupational worker is 50 millisieverts or 5 rem. So the NCERP is the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measures. It's established in 1964 by Congress. Its primary function is to provide information and recommendations about radiation measures and protections, um, pooling of resources to facilitate research and uh, cooperative effects efforts in international government organizations, so having everyone work together. So the goal, the primary goal is to keep radiation exposure to the individual well below the level at which adverse effects likely to be observed during his or her lifetime. Another objective is to minimize the incident of genetic effects. So you will need to know what the NCRP goal is. Radiation protection, so the Radiation Control for Health and Safety Act of 1968. It protects customers from hazards of radiation producing electric, electronic products. And the FDA's Bureau of Radiologic Health, so it regulates radiation performance standards that involve manufacturing and assembly of radiation producing electronic device. So research in an effort to minimize exposure to the patient, radiologic personnel, and the general public. The Atomic Energy Commission, so they oversee the nuclear power production and they manage the radioactive materials. The EPA, so the Environmental Protection Agency, um, Environmental Radiologic Health Protection, so they oversee generally everything going on. If there's a big, huge radioactive spill, the EPA clearly is going to get involved. So effective absorbed dose uh, equivalent limits. So the EDE is the effective dose equivalent. Effective dose equivalent. So the absorbed dose multiplied by the appropriate quality factor and measured in REMS. So there's the idea of this thing is that there's no threshold and we look at the risk versus the benefits. So um, it has basically the radiation guidelines, and we go by a LARA trying to keep all this down, all the radiation. Okay, so the EDE is your effective dose equivalent, and um, your dose response relationship. So the physician should use a risk versus benefit rationale when ordering radiation studies, and the benefit of the exam must outweigh the risk of the radiation exposure, and doses should be kept as low as possible, and no dose is considered totally permissible. Totally, uh, It's important to know that we are working with a non-threshold, um, so 
any amount of radiation can cause biological effects. So looking here, this is the response to the body and this is the dose. So as you can see, non-threshold is here. It's coming, showing that any dose is going to cause a biological effect. Um, not, or a threshold shows that there's an amount of radiation that the body would be able to handle before there's biological changes. So when we work in radiation, we go off of the factor that there is no threshold. So um, any amount can cause damage, biological damage. So when we talk about biological effects of radiation, so you have to look at the cell biology. So they have two main parts. There's the nucleus and the cytoplasm. The genetic material of the cell um, is contained within the nucleus. So 80% of the cell is water. Then the two uh, classes of human cells are somatic and genetic. So um, if you don't remember what a cell looks like, this is what the cell looks like. So there's two theories of cellular irradiation damage. So there's direct and indirect hit theories. So the direct involves the irradiation of water molecules in cell cytoplasm and creates free radicals. So um, the direct hit method involves x-ray photons hitting an important um, area such as the DNA causing genetic damage. So the indirect method just kind of uh, causes free radicals within the cell, so it can change the cell. Um, may not, it may be able to heal and recover, where the direct hit hits the DNA and changes the cell, damages the cell, could kill the cell, or it could rep reproduce as a different uh, genetic type, so cancer. Radiation of cells. Cells have different degrees of radiosensitivity, so um, Cellular radiosensitivity is principally a result of the rate and duration of the cell mitosis. So we talk about the division of cells. So when we are looking at our life stages, so if we look at a fetus who is growing rapidly, um, that's where we're looking that that is the most sensitive. So um, where as an adult, nerve cells are, don't change, they're the most radio uh, um, resistant. So cellular response to radiation, so results of radiation to a cell, so this can happen when radiation is, when a person is exposed. The cell can die, it can delay uh, mitosis, and it can alter the my, uh, mitotic rate. So functions of the um, cell survival to radiation, so functions as of cell survival to radiation, so cells radio sensitivity, so some cells, um, like the lining of our gut is really sensitive, uh, where our, our nerves are not. So cell radiosensitivity, we got to look at the type of damage that happened, the type of radiation that they received. Um, there's a big difference between x-rays versus um, an alpha particle within the body. And radiation exposure rate, how long were they exposed and to what dose were they exposed? So the total dose of radiation given. Um, if you're really interested in all of this, we're going to we're going to cover it again when we get to fluoroscopy, and um, this is covered a lot if you go into radiation therapy. Uh, fortunately, most cells can recover from radiation damage from diagnostic imaging. So total body response. So there's acute radiation syndrome, which requires large amounts of total body exposure. So early effects, you have a prodromal stage, latent period, and then it goes to manifest. And then you have late effects, you have somatic and genetic uh, changes, which are not good. Radiation syndromes, um, like I said, we're just going to brush over it because we're going to go really deep into this um, in floral. So these doses are far greater than those received by the occupational worker or the patient. So we can look at bone marrow syndrome, gastrointestinal syndrome, and central nervous syndrome. So there's different things that happen with um, doses of radiation. So when we look at the radiation exposure, um, this is a pretty good graph and um, it shows you our background here and then our medical little piece of pie there. And you can see comparing exposure rates, so dental, chest, mammo, uh, natural per year, CT, then we have the recommended limited uh, limits for people working in radiation, exposures to Chernobyl, um, we had detective levels of uh, Fukushima, which is very, very sad. Um, 
and then a single dose uh, could cause radiation sickness and nausea. So here, this is where we're starting to see some, some big effects. And we have a single dose uh, would kill half of those exposed within a month. And then we have the um, typical levels of Chernobyl workers who died within a month. So right there. And then fatal within weeks is 10 sieverts. Yikes. So you can just take a look at this and you can see the different um, areas that the body will react to radiation and the levels at which you're going to see uh, changes within the body. Okay, so protecting the patient. There's cardinal rules for protection. What are they? Time, distance, shielding. You should know this. So we want to reduce the time, we want to increase the distance, and we always want to wear shielding and protect the patient with lead. So x-ray beam restriction also, what does that mean? That's collimation. Image receptor speed, we want the fastest speed. Uh, we want to use filtration to filter out the soft x-rays, and we want to use the optimal exposure technique selection. So here you got your time, your distance, and your shielding, so less time spent near the source, less radiation received, greater distance is the less radiation received, that's based off of the inverse square law, and um, standing behind a barrier will also reduce your radiation exposure. So dose limits, here we go. The annual EDE is 5 rem. So students under 18 years of age limit the annual dose to 0.1. I've never had a student um, under 18, I can't imagine. But um, the pregnant worker is 0.5. You have to know these, so pay attention. Annual EDE for radiation workers is 5 rem. Students are 0.1 rem. Pregnant, 0.5 rem, and then per gestation. So that's important to clarify that. So they're only allowed to receive 0.5 rem per gestation, and that's they actually wear lead and clip the radiation badge under the lead. And then the monthly uh, dose limit of 0.05 rem or 0.5 millisieverts um, if you're looking at a monthly. So if you get zapped one month, I have to regulate that and make sure you don't exceed that amount for a month. Okay, so for the general public, the EDE is 0.5 uh, rad. Uh, rad. Do you notice how it changed from REM to rad? So REM is what we are looking at for the worker. And rad, why did we switch to rad? Radiation absorbed dose. So this is absorbed. This is general public. Permitted to have one-tenth of the uh, exposure as occupational workers. Okay. So looking here, as you can see, the whole body versus all the way down the lens of the eye is sensitive. We have to be careful with the lens of the eye and just kind of gives you an idea of what we're what we're looking at here. Okay, Alara. So we've covered this before. I'm going to give you a little assignment on your Alara. So it's the basis for the NCRP establishment to policies and procedures for radiation exposure. So minimizing radiation dose doses and releases of radioactive materials by employee all reasonable methods. So Regulatory requirements for all radiation safety programs. Now let's get down to how x-rays are produced. Now, and this is where we're going to go into um, not so much exactly what happens inside of the tube, but kind of what happens in the tube general and then what happens within the body. So we're going to cover this. Um, we're going to go deeper into this next semester. So we're just going to kind of introduce it for you, okay? Conditions necessary for x-ray production, as we talked about over the summer, you have to have a source of electrons. You have to have means for setting them into high motion, and you have to have a mechanism for decelerating them abruptly. So the source of electrons, remember, it's the electrons are boiled off of the filament into an electronic cloud. Means for putting them into high motion, we apply KVP in a potential difference so that the electrons fly across to what? The anode hits the anode, that's the deceleration, so it stops them abruptly. That's how we get x-rays, photons. All right, so the source of electrons we get from the filament, and the high-speed motion is where we do the potential difference in the KVP, and then the deceleration is on the anode when it hits the tungsten target, right? All right, oh, look at how fancy we are. All right. Oh my goodness, here we go. Okay, tube design. 
X-ray tube is a diode tube. So there's a glass envelope that maintains the vacuum. The X-ray beam is produced is um, heterogeneous. So what does that mean? It means that they're all coming off at different speeds. So they're not homogeneous, which means they'd all be the same. They're heterogeneous. So there's a kind of a bell-shaped curve. So if we come, it'd be like this, and you would have you know 70 kvp here and zero here and the average would be a lot less so the energy of the beam is expressed in kilo electron volts so kev okay so the energy of the beam is expressed in kev we're used to kvp kilovolts peak this is kilo electron volts so here we're dealing with electrons right they're not photons yet so kilo electron volts so this is your electron beam right here so here's your filament here's your anode and your tungsten target so they come across with the potential difference so you have negative negative to positive and um, that's how we we produce electrons so the x-ray beam leaves the x-ray tube toward the patient is called the primary beam so x-ray beam can undergo three possible paths total absorption within the patient it can pass through the patient with no loss of energy or it can undergo scattering or secondary interactions with some energy that is lost so looking here it can interact with atoms photons there's ionization that happens there's absorption that happens scatter that happens then we're going to look at photoelectric effect compton scatter and pair production and we're going to look at photo disintegration also. So here we've got the x-ray tube, the anode, cathode, anode, and the electrons shoot across. Now we have photons coming through and they're coming out. They're hitting the patient. They can be totally absorbed. So you can see here it's not exiting the patient. It can be scattered. So they can come off in any direction. They can come straight back at you. It's called backscatter. Or they can be off at any angle. Or they could pass through and hit the IR. So, basics here. The atom, smallest part of an element. It's made up of a nucleus, surrounded by electrons. This is the key part. It's surrounded by electrons. Okay, so keep that in mind. So a photon, or x-rays, um, are packets of energy. They're able to knock electrons out of their orbit, and it creates an electrically charged ions. So, there's different interactions that we have with matter. There's classic or coherent scattering. There's photoelectric interactions or absorption. There's Compton scattering, pair production, and photo disintegration. So here's photoelectric, Compton, and pair. These two, photoelectric and Compton, are the two that we work with in diagnostic x-ray. Pair production happens in radiation therapy. Uh, pair production and photo disintegration. The classic of coherent scattering happens with mammography, so we're going to discuss that. So here we have photoelectric effect coming in. Here's your incident x-ray. comes in and knocks out a, a shell, and you have a photoelectron. You have Compton comes in, knocks out a shell here, and you have a Compton electron. And then we look at this angle of deflection of the scatter. So let's start from the basics here. Classic of coherent scattering involves very low energy x-rays x-rays interact with the atom as a whole the atom becomes excited and, ex and emits a x-ray with the same energy so no ionization occurs and no energy transfers so this usually is in mammography we use a really really low kvp we'll go anywhere from like 25 to 35 kvp and this is what happens so it comes through and it you can see the wavelength is the same so the incident versus the scatter. So scatter is considered, a scatter photon is considered any photon that changes direction. So you have the incident coming in, and you can see here, whoa, lost it. So it's coming in, and it changes, but we don't have an energy loss. It's the same. So it changes direction. Makes this whole thing vibrate, okay? And it vibrates, and it gives off a ray, okay? So just memorize this little chain of events here. So very low x-rays, interacts with the atom as a whole, becomes excited and emits an x-ray with the same energy. 
no ionization occurs, no energy transfer um, to the patient or matter, okay? Photoelectric. So it's photoelectric effect or photoelectric absorption. You're going to see it both ways. I don't want you thrown off. So it's the most common type of energy transfer. X-ray photons eject an inner shell, K shell, well it's K or L, shell electron. Um, you get a photoelectron and the photon absorbed by the matter. So um, an ion pair is created and usually low energy photons. So this is lower energy than Compton, but higher than your classic. All right, so occurs within the diagnostic x-ray range. So the incoming x-ray photon is completely absorbed by the collision with the inner shell electron. So it's usually the K or L shell that it's hitting and you can see the incident comes in and knocks it out and it's called a photoelectron when it knocks it out. There's a vacancy here which makes this very unstable. So you have to have a shell, a, a higher number shell, drop in to the inner shell. And when it drops in, you get a characteristic photon that comes off. So it gives off energy when it drops down into the lower shell. So the photoelectron leaves the atom, creating an ion pair. The free electron eventually unites with other matter and is absorbed completely. The secondary radiation created as a result of the electron cascade from the outer inner shell. So this is called uh, cascade, characteristic cascade. So as each one drops down, it gives off this characteristic um, cascade of radiation. All right. So Compton, all right, occurs with, within diagnostic x-ray energies. So the incoming photon collides with an outer shell electron, creating a free Compton electron, or what we call a recoil, and an ion pair. So it comes in, so photoelectric hits an inner shell. Compton hits an outer shell. So it comes in, the incident photon hits one of the electrons knocks it out, and this is called the recoil electron. And then you have a wave coming off here. So this is called um, the scattered photon. So you have a recoil electron and a scattered photon giving you an ion pair. Okay, so the angle of uh, deflection, we're gonna talk about that more in next semester. So with Compton scatter, the X-ray photon interacts with the outer shell electron portion of the incident photon energy is transferred to the orbital electron and um, ejected Compton electron and scattered ejected Compton electron and scattered x-ray photon so you get both the scattered x-ray photon loses energy and can change direction it's capable of interacting with other atoms by Compton or photoelectric effect so depending on the energy it can do either another Compton interaction or it can be absorbed in photoelectric effect. So incoming photon loses some of its energy through the collision, scatters off in a random direction so you have this angle, and undergoes other interactions until the energy is gone. So the electron vacancy is filled nearly instantly. So we have um, Unmodified scatter or classic scattering, so the entering photon changes direction, does not give up any energy, and you have the modified scattering is when the collision occurs, the photon gives off parts of its energy in the removal of the electron. So, Compton, incident, photon coming in, and it hits, right, the electron at rest. You have your recoil electron, and you have your scattered photon. We can find the cosine of these angles, um, but we're not going to do it now. We'll do it later. Pair production. So now we are out of working with diagnostic x-ray. Now we're going into radiation therapy. So pair production is higher energy photons. Incoming photon must be at least 1.02 MeV of energy. Interacts with the nuclear field around the nucleus and so you can see here, it comes in and it hits the nucleus and it gives you a positive electron and a negative electron. So the positive electron also has a free negative electron. You have annihilation 
where it explodes again and you have 0 0.051 MeV photon and 0 0.51 MeV photon. So when it splits, you get this annihilation, so that's big, you gotta remember annihilation, and then it splits off into two different uh, photons, one at 0 0.51 MeV and one at 0 0.51 MeV, okay? So the two together total 1.02 MeV of energy, okay? So more on pair production, we have two particles reappear, each with equal energy, 0.51 MeV. Um, the positron collides with the free electron and creates annihilation. Annihilation reaction creates two photons at opposite angles from each other. So uh, photons of high energy interact with the nucleus. So that's important. It interacts with the nucleus where in diagnostic x-ray we interact with the electrons, right? So the nucleus is radiation therapy and that's um, pair production and photo disintegration. So nucleus. A uh, positron and a negatron are formed, annihilation reaction, you have the 1.02 MeV and you it's usually within, well it's always within radiation therapy. Photo disintegration requires photon energies that are extremely high. Incoming photon interacts with the nucleus, there it is again, of an atom creating a nuclear instability. So it comes in and then you get a nuclear fragment out. So that's really high. Nuclear fragment is given off as a nucleus seeks stability. Common interaction in the nuclear industry. So there you go. So biological effects of radiation. So cells, highly organized structures composed of nucleus surrounding the cytoplasm. And then we have the cell nucleus. We have the chromosomes, the genes, and the DNA. Any kind of hit in the nucleus is not good. The cytoplasm is responsible for protein synthesis and metabolism. So here's a review of the cell also, if you forgot, and biological effects of ionizing radiation. We have germ cells responsible for sexual reproduction, so 23 chromosomes, and somatic cells perform all other body functions, so 46 chromosomes. And when, a, when radiation hits a cell, there's things that can happen. No cellular damage at all, which is great. Cellular, cellular damage, but it can repair. Okay, so it's hit, it's damaged, it's limping, but it can repair itself. Then there's cellular damage with no repair. So the cell is either going to die or reproduce improperly. And then there's cell death. So we are concerned here um, with cellular damage and no repair and cell death. So no cellular damage, yippee cellular damage but repair that's what we look for um, we want the cells to be able to repair themselves so we talked about the direct and indirect so once again review it the direct hit is interactions with the DNA and damage to the DNA and this is where the cancer comes from indirect interacts with the water in the cell there's radiolysis and free radicals so mitosis the process of somatic cell division whereby a parent cell divides to make two daughter cells that are replicas of the parent. So with meiosis, cell division in germ cells consisting of two cellular divisions but only one DNA reproduction, replication, sorry, same difference. All right, there's um, Bergenies and Troubadeau law of radiosensitivity. So radiosensitive cells are ones that are rapidly dividing, immature or non-specialized or non-differentiated. So lymphocytes are the most radiosensitive, where nerve cells are the most radioresistant. So the latent period, what is latent period? Is the time between the initial irradiation and the occurrence of any biological damage. Depends on the type of radiation and the rate of the radiation along with the total dose. So if you're um, exposed at Fukushima, um, it depends on the amount of radiation that you received on how long your latent period is. All right, so with acute radiation syndrome, we're gonna cover this again. Short-term effects, there's minutes, hours, or days, weeks. Um, high whole body doses are greater than 100 R in a short period of time, yikes. Um, Long-term effects, there's somatic, so sexual reproduction, cancer, cataracts, shortens the lifespan. Um, with genetic, it's transmitted to future generations, so 
Um, the DAN code is damaged. Um, I think that's supposed to be DNA. That's interesting that they screwed that up. I didn't even catch it till just now. The DNA is damaged. Okay, so it's going to reproduce improperly. So, other causes of genetic mutations: um, drugs, increase in body temperature, chemicals, viruses. Spontaneous mutations occur in every generation, so um, we can't necessarily say that mutations are from radiation. It's hard to prove. Um, gonads must be exposed to an ionizing radiation to have that happen. All right, mutations may occur in um, successive generations, so there's no threshold dose. We talked about that. Increased probability of recessive gene mutations and no way to identify, identify chromosomal mutations. Radiation-induced mutations not indistinguishable from other mutations. So that's where the hard part is. It's like, is that from the high dose of radiation that they received or is this just a spontaneous mutation within that person's uh, DNA? So um, the radiation exposures are irreversible and can be inherited. So. Sources of exposure. We have x-rays, so there's external, and there's three cardinal principles. We talked about that already. So there's minimize time, maximize distance, maximize shielding. And with radial nuclei, there's, um, they're more internal, um, so inside the body. So radiation therapy and nuclear medicine, radioactive half-life, when you look at that, and good housekeeping processes. All right. Radioactive half-life. What is that? So the half-life is defined as the time for the activity uh, of the nuclei to be reduced to one half of its initial value. So radioactive half-life. How do we get the radioactivity down to half? So that's considered the half-life. So patient protection is responsible for the RT. So you need to make sure that the patient is protected. And there's three cardinal rules. You want to reduce the time the patient's being exposed. You want to increase the distance um, that you can for the patient and shield them when you can. You want to collimate, and you need to use the fastest image receptor speed. Uh, you need to use the basic filtration to filter out the lower energy uh, photons and pick the proper technique. So when we talk about exposure factors, we have the KVP, time, and distance. So you want to use the highest KVP that you can so that um, you're using Compton and hopefully the, there's less absorption into the body. So you want to use high KVP to decrease the skin dose by decreasing the potential of photoelectric effect or absorption. Short exposure times decreases the chances of motion from the patient so you don't have a repeat. So the inverse square law has the distance um, away from the radiation source increases, the radiation exposure decreases. So here, as you can see, if you have a 10 by 12 here or a 10 by 10, you have your radiation source, you have all the photons hitting on this small piece. If you still had just the small piece, you can see there would be less photons hitting because they're spread out over a larger geographic area. So as you get further away, the intensity decreases, not the amount of photons, they're just spread out over a larger area. So here's your inverse square law. Oh, sorry, that's so fuzzy. So you have your intensity of one over intensity two equals the distance of two squared over the distance of one squared, inverse. So they're inversely related, squared. Okay, <laughs> don't forget the squared part. So as you can see here, at two feet, you can see at same size person here, as you go, if you double your distance and then you take it up to um, six feet, you can see here that the photons are spread out over a larger area. So at a distance, of 15 cm, the intensity of the beam is known to be 100 R per minute. If the distance is changed to 30 cm, what is the new intensity? So uh, you'd have to calculate that out. I think it's 25, I think. I'd have to calculate it out. All right, filtration, what is it? Oh, let me just say here, be sure that you can calculate 
out the inverse square law. We'll all have um, stuff for you to practice. Okay, filtration. It's aluminum um, that we use to absorb low energy um, x-ray beam that contribute to patient dose. So really it's just skin dose. So these um, photons don't have enough energy to even penetrate past the skin. So we use filtration to filter those out. So that's what we're really talking about with our classic, okay? So we use a filter to take out the photons that would only contribute to skin dose. For equipment operating above 70 kbp, required minimum filtration is 2.5 millimeters of aluminum. Radiographic tubes are manufactured with an inherent filtration of 0.5 to 0.9 aluminum, millimeters of aluminum. So we're looking here. Here is our x-ray tube and you can see our glass housing and then we have our lead housing around the outside. And we have one millimeter of uh, aluminum here. Our mirror is one millimeter of aluminum and then our window uh, coming out of our x-ray tube is 0.5 millimeters of aluminum. So the 0.5 with the 1 millimeters plus our mirror out of 1 millimeter is 2.5 millimeters of aluminum. So here is out of Carlton and this is a book that you guys will have your second year and you can see this component right here and we've got all the different uh, filters there equaling uh, 2.5 millimeters. So 0.5 millimeters um, or equivalent. Then we have the tube design, we have the glasser envelope, we have the oil bath and the window for the housing. So all of it equals um, the 2.5 millimeters of aluminum. So grids, we use them to absorb scatter radiation that is created by the interaction of primary um, radiation with matter before the scattered reaches the image receptor. So radiation absorbing material so we use typically lead or aluminum. Uh, grids do not increase patient dose, okay? Why? Because they're placed underneath the patient. So what happens is you have your primary x-rays. They're coming straight down. They are gonna make it through all these little lead strips because they're going straight. But the scattered photon that's coming out of the body going sideways here is going to get absorbed by these lead strips so that they're not getting through because it's misinformation. If this piece was representing the kidney, but it's coming off at a sideward angle, it's gonna misrepresent the kidney size, shape, pathologies, everything. So coming straight through are the diagnostic ones that we want. So a grid is going to clean up your scattered x-rays. So you can see here, you have your x-ray tube coming down. You have scatter radiation going in all directions. You have a grid here, and the grid is only taking the photons coming straight through to hit the image receptor. So the grid is always underneath the patient and above your image receptor. Collimation. Restriction of the primary beam to a limited area. Can be formed manually or automatic with uh, PBL, which is positive beam limitation. You can use cones or diaphragms. We have diaphragms on all of our tubes. And you can see here, we have your, here's your tube, here's your window, then you have aluminum, and then we have our mirror, and here's the light, this is how it works, and you have your collimators here. So here's your blades. You have in uh, two different planes here. So these shutters come together this way, and these guys come together this way. So you're able to... Uh, shrink it down to just the size that you need for the patient. Repeat exposures are really, really big on patient dose. So um, use restraining devices devices if you can. Um, make sure you use a technique chart or know the technique for what you're shooting. Don't guess. And uh, make sure that there's a quality control program in place to make sure that one, your repeats are within range, There's and two, there's nothing wrong with your equipment. Shielding devices, so gonadal shields. Um, use when gonads are in or near the primary beam. Um, they should not impede the exam and can reduce the gonadal dose by 95%. So they're composed of lead. Any kind of shields are lead. So operator aprons are 0.5 millimeters of lead. PB means lead, PB is lead. Gloves are 0.25 millimeters of lead. Floral aprons are 1.5 millimeters of lead up to 100 kvp and 1.8 millimeters of lead over 100 kvp. Know those numbers. 
There's different uh, shielding devices. So there's uh, shadow shields, flat contact shields, and shape shields that we use for patients. And here's some of them. You can see these are just little flat contact shaped. So give you an idea, the different ones. All right, personnel protection. Why should the exposure to an RT be important? So we don't want to expose you. You are not allowed to hold as a student, as you know. So protective equipment. We supply gloves, aprons, and glasses. Um, the exposure cord on a portable uh, should be six feet. Uh, in the diagnostic rooms, the exposure switch needs to be zip tied to the console. So you cannot walk around the corner and expose. All right. So um, distance is your friend. Uh, you need to get behind a shielded booth or a portable shield. And RT should not hold patients. Um, try to get family members to hold the patient or use restraining devices. But as a student, you are flat out not allowed to hold. All right, personal monitoring. So film badge worn at the level of the collar outside the apron. It's accurate to 10 millirem. Um, there's TLD, dosimetry, lithofluoride, and it's accurate to 5 millirem. All right. So personal monitoring. There's a scintillation counter, a Geiger-Muller counter, a ionization chamber, and a pocket ionization chamber. So we have two Geiger counters. We have an ionization chamber, and we do have pocket ionization chambers, but I have not figured them out to be accurate. They work about half the time. <laughs> All right, radiation monitoring. Any occupational worker who is regularly exposed to ionizing radiation must be monitored and determined, uh, determined estimate exposure. Any worker who is likely to receive more than one-tenth of the recommended dose equivalent limit should be monitored. So it's known as personal monitoring dosimeters. It's common monitoring technologies. Like you guys have those little blue jump drives. That's what those are. We used to have this here, land hour, and it was a disaster for us. So we went to these little jump drives. You had to mail these in every month. So um, monitor measures the quantity of radiation received on the basis of conditions in which the radiographer was placed. So exposure data are collected in a specified period of time. So these were monthly, which were really a pain in the butt. All right, so it's to be worn at the collar level outside the lead apron, and they should face forward. Pregnant workers should have a second device worn at waist level and under the lead apron. So, conclusion, finally. Um, X-radiation has the potential to create ionization in human tissue. Ionization can be harmful and cause cell disturbances and genetic alterations. Effects may be early or late and are dose-dependent. They use, use the cardinal rules of protection, and you'll have to be able to label those. Radiographers should have a professional responsibility to consistently practice ALARA. All right, so that is your radiation safety and biology PowerPoint, and this should get you through your quiz. Make sure you read um, your two chapters, so you're looking at your Carlton Adler book and your patient care book and your yellow book that we used over the summer. So those two will have everything you need to do well on your quiz.